Welcome to another edition of American Rambler. I'm your host, Colin Woodward. Thank you for listening to the podcast. On today's show, I have journalist Frank Smith. Frank and I had a long conversation about his career as a journalist in places such as Central America and the Mideast. And the reason why I reached out to Frank was I had already been following him on Twitter, and he has written a book on the NRA, which we're going to get to in part two of this conversation. So we had a long talk, and I've split it up into two parts, but uh, I had known Frank from Twitter and knew about his book on the NRA. I wanted to talk to him because I'm going to be doing a podcast soon about the book Arming America, and so I wanted to get a little bit of background on the NRA and the history of that, the history of gun ownership in America. But Frank has a impressive resume of stories that he has written about going back to the 1980s, so we cover a lot of ground here in terms of his career and his start as a college student in Boston and then went to Johns Hopkins for his graduate school and then went down to Central America to cover the war in El Salvador. So we're going to get into the politics a bit, and also what he was doing there and how long. And it is a complicated story, what's going on in Central America. I mean, you really go from country to country in this time period, and you have not only the civil wars, but also the drug war going on. And so I try to untangle that a little bit with Frank, uh, but he has a lot of interesting stories about his time there. So this is the longer of the two conversations. Part two about his book about the NRA will be coming up on the next episode. And in doing my background on Frank, he has a lot of his articles and essays at his website, franksmith.com. That is Smith with a Y. But I read one that I thought was really interesting. I'm going to put the link on the podcast. But it's an essay called The Chance to Cry. It's written back in May of 2002. And it is about Frank's time in the Mideast when he was captured by Saddam Hussein's forces and was in prison for 18 days and not released until Saddam Hussein ordered it. And this essay, The Chance to Cry, it's about Frank seeing the movie Life is Beautiful. And after seeing the movie, he goes out for a drink and the movie triggered something in him. And he has a really emotional experience thinking about his time when he was captured. And the movie, if you've seen it, is about the concentration camps. So, you know, nowadays we would call it, uh, it triggered him. And people didn't really use that term back in 2002, but... It's definitely what happened to Frank. Um, So this is just one of the essays I thought was really good. You know, obviously this is written way before COVID, but it made me think of what we've been going through in the last year. And hopefully some of us who've been dealing with some major stress in COVID and everything else that's going on in our lives, that occasionally maybe we have had the chance to cry. I talked about this with Mike Scott. We were talking of all things, the kid detective and the end of that movie and again that was something that was done before covid but when i watched the movie i was kind of thinking well he's having a covid moment i for one have have certainly had some emotional moments in the past year and now that we've got the vaccine i mean things are looking better but uh, some days it can be kind of rough because we're not certainly over this but i think we've all kind of experienced our own level of trauma uh, with COVID, and I haven't even lost anyone to it, thankfully, uh, but a lot of people have. So I, I thought this was a really good essay. It does talk about Frank's time in Iraq and the experiences in the prison there. We don't talk about it so much in this podcast. We do talk about a lot of things, but we don't get into detail about that. So I wanted to put this up on the website, and if you're interested in that story, you should definitely check it out the chance to cry. We're going to talk about some heavy stuff here. And Frank is a great guest in the sense of, you know, I didn't have to say a whole lot during the course of this conversation. So you're going to learn a lot about Frank's assignments all around the world uh, leading up to his book on the NRA, which we will cover in part two. So here it is, part one of my talk with Frank Smith. Where are you right now? New York City. Okay. Yeah. You've been there for a while, I'm guessing. I've been there over the past year. Yeah, just the past. I moved in right before the pandemic, so I've been in New York exactly oh. a year about now. Bad move, but um, hey. 
<laughs> yeah, well, uh, we were sort of all in the same boat. I don't, what was it like? You were just before, was that like February, January? I moved January? in in March 1st and probably moved oh. in right around now, you know, actually moved in. Wow. Yeah, that's that's rough. Are you originally from there? I'm from New Jersey. New Jersey. Okay. Yeah. You know, I was looking over your, your resume and you got a pretty impressive journalistic resume. So I, I, you know, definitely want to get to your book because that, that came out last year, right? March, Um, March 31st. Okay. So you moved to New York pandemic and then your book comes out. Yeah. So had you had some things planned? Like, were you going to do a tour or talks? We didn't have a tour, but I mean, the the idea was to do uh, a lot of, a lot of media on the book. We did a, uh, I did NPR and uh, and then later the BBC and NPR again, and I did a lot of podcasts. But what we didn't yeah. get is any cable coverage because it was all COVID uh, all the time. You know, Co- between COVID right. and Trump, there was no no uh, air for left for anything else. Um, no, and it's still pretty much COVID. You know, most of the time on the news. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, I mean, I think it'll. I think the book's coming back. Is the issue's coming back, but. Um, I just have to be patient. That's all. Okay, so you're so you're a New Jersey guy, but you went to school in Boston, Boston College. Boston College, and then uh, at Johns Hopkins. Okay, was um was there any Catholic strings attached with going to BC, or did you? Just yeah, I was raised Catholic. School? I was raised Catholic, and uh, so that had part of. By then, I don't think I was no longer really a practicing Catholic, but still, um, that certainly influenced me. And then for a while, I thought maybe, I, you know, what am I doing here? But then I realized it was, uh, it worked out well. You know, well, I learned a lot from BC and uh, it was a great education. And, uh, you know, it was, uh, I, I feel fortunate to have had the experience, to be honest. Did you go in thinking you were going to be a journalist? Uh, no, I didn't, right? That didn't come until grad school, to be honest. Okay. You know, uh, I what, was your major, what was your major at BC? Uh, English. Okay. English. Yeah. Well, that's well, a good foundation. Yeah. And, and I, you know, BC's, um, your major only takes up uh, maybe 30% of your total course load. So you're able to take a lot of other courses. So I took a lot of political science and economics and sociology, right? Um, and even a law course and some other things. So I was able to dabble, you know, okay. um, in other social, in the social sciences, which is, which prepared me then for grad school and what I really wanted to do. So I didn't just, no, I didn't just study literature. And did they make you do a minor there? No, there was no minor. You know, okay. I, I double majored to get into classes. So at one point I was a triple major, but that was, <laughs> that was just to get into uh, classes. Cause if you're a major, you get priority. Okay. Right? So what was your other, ma- what was your other major? Poli sci? I, I think poli sci and uh, sociology. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'm I'm from the neck of the woods. I'm from Massachusetts, and uh, I went to school at Trinity, so I wasn't too far out of out of Mass. Yeah, I was a double major too, and I'm obviously BC is a great school. Did you like living in Boston? I love living in Boston. That was uh, that was one of the best parts of going to BC. You know, well, at least a, in, the, in the Boston area, you know. Yeah, and I'm not I'm not sure exactly when you were there, but I mean, it's a great. It's a great newspaper town, or at least it, it was when we, you know, newspapers were bigger than they are now. But um, did you sort of, did you start writing when you were at BC? No, I was pre- I was active politically, but I didn't start, I didn't write for the newspaper at all. Okay. And uh, so I didn't start writing, writing even for any kind of publication until grad school. And that's okay. when it sort of dawned on me that uh, maybe journalism was the way to go. But that certainly so you, wasn't my interest in the beginning. So you, you were an activist. What what kind of things were you? I was I was very much involved in environmental issues. That okay. uh, meant a lot to me. And then uh, the the conflict in El Salvador, the killing of the rape and murders of the four American church women in December of 1980, was a pivotal moment for me because um, I couldn't believe that had occurred, and that I was shocked at the Reagan administration's attempt and Alexander Haig's attempt, the Secretary of State at the time, to suggest that the, these uh, nuns and churchwomen had run a roadblock, and that's why they ended up being raped and murdered. And uh, that was just patently ridiculous as it, as, it, as it was. 
And that led me to want to learn more about what was happening in Central America and, uh, and why the United States would be supporting a government that was committing these kinds of abuses. And uh, yeah, yeah. that sort of was a, that was a, a life that that was a shift in my life arc as a result of that, my you know now, that, that massacre. You you said you weren't a practicing Catholic when you were BC, but were these things? I'm, I'm I'm guessing they were being discussed a lot. Was the church talking about it at the time in Boston? I wouldn't know. To tell you the truth, okay. right? I think okay. that yeah. I mean, there was a lot of there was a lot of outrage, right? There was a lot of. Uh, because these were these were women of the church, right? So there was a lot of outrage. I certainly heard about it on campus in a graduate uh, class that I was in from another student in the class. Uh, what was happening in El Salvador, and then when the nuns made news that that had happened, uh, that really um, made me think about why in the world is the United States? Why is my government on the wrong side of this? You know, and I yeah. think there was a lot of outrage from people like Joe Moakley who later pay, played a pivotal role in the Jesuit murders. And by then I was covering that, right? So that was uh, nine years later. And okay. uh, so that, that um, but there was a lot of outrage at the time, right? And there, was, yeah. there were a lot of protests too about the war in El Salvador in particular in Boston. Yeah. Um, and there was some religious support for that, maybe quieter than the people who were protesting, but nonetheless it was there. It's a Catholic school, but I don't, you know, I don't know how kind of overt it is there at, at BC or was at the time. Did that did it start as a Jesuit school? It's still a Jesuit school. It's still it's a still Jesuit is. school. Okay. It's not okay. an official Catholic school because American University is an official Catholic school, it means it follows Catholic doctrine. Uh, Jesuit schools aren't that aren't don't necessarily follow strict Catholic doctrine, but they're Jesuit led um, and Jesuit infused, right? Which means you know, I had, uh, you might have a few professors who are uh, Jesuits, and I had uh, I had two professors who were nuns, who were both excellent uh, professors. Uh, but, you yeah. know, 90% of, your, of the faculty are, are lay, lay faculty, maybe more, you know. Yeah, you, you know, I, I had a, a nun teaching my Catholicism class at Trinity, and I had an uncle who was, he was in South America, he was a priest, and he was in South America at some point, I think. I think it was before it started to get really bad. Maybe it was more like the early, the early seventies or, or maybe even before, but, but he had been down there and we used to see him around and he knew fluent Spanish. And I was like, who is this guy? You know, it was, uh, <laughs> he seemed like he was from, you know, El Salvador or something. Uh, but uh, he, he lived in New York and, but he, he'd gone down there. So you decide to go to Hopkins for grad school. Is this journalism or is this, for English again. I had taken a year off to travel uh, okay. after my senior year. And I was uh, interested in, I was torn between becoming an environmental lawyer and between uh, my interest in social justice uh, in El Salvador in particular, but more broadly in the region. And uh, I ended up going to law school briefly at the University of Denver to study environmental law. But I ended up leaving after five weeks because it became clear that um, I really didn't want to be a lawyer and I really didn't want to spend that much time when they were talking about, you know, your advisors, well, you want to, you want to, you know, three years of law school and then you want to get a clerkship. And I thought, you know, by the time I'm done with all this, the war in El Salvador is going to be over. And by now this was 1983, 84. And I wanted to, I really wanted to get to Salvador. So I dropped out and then moved uh, back to back East, ended up getting a job on wall street. And then from there, I ended up getting into Johns Hopkins and going first to Italy and then Washington. So that okay. was a, a bit of a, of, a, of a zigzag until I found my way, which I, you know, which a lot of kids, I think, go through, I think. Yeah, sure. And what specifically were you studying in Hopkins? Uh, Latin American studies. Okay. Yeah, but, you know, it's, a, it's an international studies school. And again, uh, most of your classes are not in Latin American studies, right? You have a fair amount of leeway. So... Um, I was able to take classes in the Middle East and other regions and economic development, which I found quite interesting uh, and other matters that uh, courses on, uh, on Eastern Europe, things like that. So it was really, uh, it was, it was, it was really an international studies degree um, more than anything else. And were you learning Spanish? I was learning Spanish. It took me quite a while to, to master it, but uh, I eventually uh, went to Guatemala to learn Spanish and then, 
And then I, when I finally moved to Salvador and lived there is when I finally started becoming uh, uh, much better at Spanish. Okay. And when do you first end up in El Salvador? I first went to Salvador in 1985, uh, taking a trip on a bus with a, with a buddy of mine. That I, that I met you know, in Guatemala, but we were both going to the same school while I was uh, as a break after studying Spanish in Guatemala. And okay. uh, we met a we met a woman who befriended us and brought us to her family's house uh, outside of uh, San Salvador in a place called Santa Tecla. And that became my base because I later got an internship to go back to Salvador and I ended up staying with that family, actually, uh, while I was doing my research. Okay, well, I, you know, I was I was growing up in the in the eighties, and I would hear things about you know what was going on down there, and later there was the Iran Contra controversy and everything. Can you sort of? Uh, it's, I know it's really complicated, but can you kind of give us an idea of what what was going on in the mid eighties in Salvador, and kind of what you were there to cover exactly? Yeah, the mid eighties in El Salvador was an interesting period because. The, uh, the, the intensity of the death squad period earlier in the war and the rise of the leftist guerrillas in response to government and extra government repression had, had, had ended, right? Or at least it shifted to a different phase. There were still death squads active in El Salvador, but the war had shifted to the countryside. And the United States under the Reagan administration was trying to build up the Salvadoran army to be able to wage an effective counterinsurgency campaign, campaign with a minimal amount of human rights abuses because there was so much scrutiny from Congress and threatens the cut aid if human rights, rights abuses weren't kept under control. And the president of El Salvador was a man named Jose Napoleon Duarte, who was a Christian Democrat uh, and pre- presented himself as a centrist, but he really became the conduit by which military aid in El Salvador was able to escalate and a, and a bipartisan coalition formed around him. But he was somebody who I saw as an opportunist and really a self-server, who, whose rhetoric was designed as much for his American audience in Washington and in Congress as it was uh, for anyone in El Salvador. And evidence of this uh, to me was, while he was president of the country, he wrote his autobiography, And he got a book deal uh, out of New York and I got a ghostwriter who I also later met and published this book. But he published the book while he's president of El Salvador in a New York deal and available only in English. They never even thought to translate it into Spanish. So I eventually got to ask him in a rather in an an interview with other reporters and a very pointed question. Why is it that you're president of a country and you would write a biography and publish it in New York in a language that your own constituents cannot understand? Can you explain that? Right. And, you know, his his answer was was a dodge. Right. I mean, what could he say except, uh, well, he wanted to tell his story, you know, but he really was catering to his American audience. So he was somebody who I, you know, was really all show and no substance. Um, And at the same time. What, the, the, what he did is he allowed the military to build up, but at the same time, the guerrillas were building up. And that all came to a head uh, some years later, about four years later in 1989, when I was there and had been there then for uh, almost two years, when the offensive occurred in November of 1989 in El Salvador, beginning right about the same time that the Brandenburg Gate opened and the Berlin Wall over the ensuing uh, week began to fall, the offensive in El Salvador was unfolding at the same time, right? Which was the largest guerrilla offensive in the history of that war. And I think actually the largest guerrilla offensive in the history of Latin America, because the fighting was was much broader uh, and involved many more cities than anything that even had occurred in Cuba uh, back during its uh, revolution. And the Jesuits were murdered uh, five days, a uh, little five days into that, uh, into that, uh, into that uh, offensive uh, by the army as a way of trying to turn the tide against the guerrillas. It backfired, but uh, that was their thinking. And to, to grossly oversimplify things, is, is U.S. policy under Reagan essentially we're going to back the strongman gover- government, existing government against these guerrillas the, who are you know, leftist, communist, whatever they were, the, out of fear of, you know, spread of communism in Central America? Is that essentially what we're worried about down there? Well, they were worried about the guerrillas, but the way they framed it is we're supporting democracy. We're supporting the center 
which is represented by Duarte allegedly against the okay. extremes of the left and the extreme left and the extreme right. And this is really a ruse because it really, uh, Duarte was a vehicle to build up the military and, and provide military support. But the Reagan administration's policy was to fight a long counterinsurgency war, a war of attrition against the guerrillas that by 1988, uh, the ambassador Edwin Kaur thought would take, you know, another many more years, even a decade more, perhaps, to finally defeat the guerrillas. So they were prepared to, to, to continue to back the military to wage this long thought out struggle they thought would eventually defeat the guerrillas, who they thought posed no serious threat to the state itself. And the November offensive was so strong by the guerrillas and so overwhelming and had taken both the Salvadoran government and U.S. intelligence services by surprise. And I did a piece in the Village Voice at the time called Caught With Their Pants Down, which was a quote from a Western diplomat, a non-American Western diplomat about how they had been left flat-footed, that that turned everything around and the Jesuit murders turned everything around. And then the Bush administration, when it came in, partly due to James Baker, uh, uh, and I recently had a chance to ask Susan Glasser and Peter Baker about their book about Mr. Baker and about his role in the Salvador War. And what they said is that Baker was already there. He already thought the Reagan administration was too adventurous uh, in, their, in their foreign policy endeavors. And so when the, when the Salvadoran offensive happened and then the Jesuit murders and then the proposal to cut military aid by 50 percent, the Bush administration shifted policy, HW, from a military seeking a military victory to a negotiated settlement, which then occurred within less than two more years. So in a way, there was a, there was a, a negotiated settlement was achieved, and, and that was a good thing, I think. What's sort of the end result with all this? Who kind of comes out on top in El Salvador? Well, the war ended, so I think that was, uh, that was the main thing after 70,000 deaths, and uh, it allowed the country to develop. It also didn't lead to great uh, economic or socioeconomic reform. So the migration that had started uh, back, back uh, by 1980, if not a little bit before, and continued throughout the 80s, then continued, even though El Salvador man managed to grow. Uh, and the, uh, and the guerrillas uh, that had been fighting for power outside the system eventually uh, were able to get elected and join power. Although, of course, once they had power, they, it wasn't, they weren't able to do as much with it as they had hoped. And there was ev evidence of corruption and malfeasance and what, what you would expect from almost any elected leader, some, some level of, uh, of incompetence and failed expectations, failed expectations. The downside was is the rise of the gang phenomenon, which was a, a combination of uh, U.S. immigration policies, deportations of, of uh, young people who had become involved in Salvadoran gang, Salvadoran ethnic Salvadoran gangs in the United States, deported back to El Salvador, where they then uh, continue those activities, and that's a, that's really the 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 ugly uh, result of, of the post-war era that no one's really been able to resolve so far effectively. And I'm guessing. The drug war is complicating everything too, right? Because sort of this is all dovetailing with the war on drugs in the 1980s, and I'm guessing probably both sides in Salvador are trying to use drug money to some degree to help their cause, or or not. I don't know. What what? How did that sort of add to the chaos there? Yeah, drug trafficking started coming into El Salvador through the uh, Air Force. Uh, as we understand, during the war, and after the war, there was so there was some uh, some evidence of some cartels in El Faro, the the independent news out online news outlet, uh, broke uh, a number of those stories. But drug trafficking in El Salvador, laid largely due to its geography, was never as robust as it was in Guatemala, especially in later Honduras. Uh, it just didn't. It just uh, there weren't enough advantages to country to traffickers to use El Salvador as a transshipment point. In most cases, when Guatemala was much closer to Mexico and had access to more to more sea and air and land routes than uh, than Salvador did, being only on the Pacific coast, um, okay. So that was a factor, but not a major one in Salvador. I mean, this is a this is a pretty heavy assignment. Um, and you said you you were writing for the Village Voice. How did you sort of? I, I mean, I know you were studying Spanish and international studies and things like that, but like. Kind of what was your what was your portal into writing this kind of journalism? How do you go from Hopkins to Central America exactly? Well, when I was at Hopkins, I started writing, and um, I had given a talk for just just at the school for other students, 
And one of the uh, uh, one of the people who was an editor at the Sice Review said, "You know, I've never heard that. Would you want to write it up for the Sice Review?" And he was a uh, he was a guy. His name's Larry Dorita. He's a Republican. Ended up being Rumsfeld's chief of staff, I think, later on under the W administration. But he liked the piece, and he ended up running it. And it was uh, it was uh, don't put El Salvador in the win column yet. And I made the case that the labor movement, right? And that's the other thing that, that I was covering back then. I got a research grant to look at the labor movement. In the mid 80s under Duarte, uh, you had the labor movement split into a pro uh, Duarte, pro Salvadoran government federation, and then an anti-government federation uh, suspected of having ties to the FMLN, which I think was uh, at least on some level true, right? And I started studying the labor movement and managed to obtain, um, after having done pieces for the SICE review and then got lent to El Salvador, I ended up investigating uh, the labor uh, movement and this split and this and what was going on. And, it's, and it was clear that the U.S. Embassy, through uh, the American Institute for Free Labor Development, known as AFEL by the acronym, which was affiliated with the AFL-CIO, was working with the U.S. Embassy. And I got U.S. Uh, cables uh, up to confidential that showed that the U.S. Embassy was working with AFEL to divide and destroy, quote unquote, the opposition labor movement by bribing union leaders with uh, the first payment to one group was $3,500 a month of support for, the, for their labor federation, which is quite a bit of money, it's to, uh, to leave the, the, the anti-government labor federation and join the pro-government labor federation. So essentially, Colin, I made the transition from writing academically, as I had done in grad school, to starting to write uh, journalistically. And I did my first piece, uh, my first major story after writing for a newsletter in Washington for a while, the Latin American Index. My first piece was on this labor split based on these confidential uh, U.S. Uh, documents uh, for the nation in uh, March 1987. So that was okay. the, that was where the transition uh, came from. And I mean, kind of logistically, how does this work? I mean, you're you're sort of writing in grad school, and then you're obviously involved in politics, and you you want you want to be a writer, but like, how do you do this? Like, do, do you contact a, a magazine and say, okay, we'll buy your plane ticket, and then you're going over? Like, how does it sort of work as a as a freelancer around this time period? Well, when I got out of SICE, um, I had already I had been to Salvador um, and it, and gotten a research grant and done some research. And okay. then uh, when I came back, I, I got a job as a bartender, right, um, in Washington uh, and bartended for a number of uh, a number of people, including a number of pretty well-known reporters who were my clients or my customers. This was at uh, Stetson's, right, a fairly okay. famous bar back in the day. And um, so I called, I called, I got uh, Wayne Smith, who was a professor at SICE, knew uh, Victor Navasky at The Nation. So I called him with uh, Wayne's blessing. And then he turned me on to George Black, who's become a good friend and an author and a tremendous journalist. And he edited that piece and it ran there. I called, I had a piece that I wanted to do for the progressive based on torture and discussions I had had with uh, former U.S. intelligence uh, people about uh, what they were trained in terms of interrogation tactics and something called negative incentive. And I, uh, because the U.S., the U.S. approach at that point was trying to teach Central American interrogators how to how to, how to not how to not commit torture, at least overt torture, you know, things that were more involving sleep deprivation, right? So you, uh, to not, which still arguably from a human rights perspective are forms of torture, but something that doesn't leave marks or evidence of that abuse. And I thought that was a good story and I managed to uh, uh, place that in the progressive. And then uh, the Iran-Contra hearings began. And Oliver North, during one of the hearings, made a reference to Felix Rodriguez, the, the famous CIA operative, and in operations involving the CIA in El Salvador. And what he was talking about was a transition from CIA-led CIA -led long-range reconnaissance patrols to then special forces uh, advised long-range reconnaissance patrols and then turned over the Salvadoran military. And I did that piece uh, for the Village Voice. I called them cold and just managed to get somebody on the phone and... Uh, and get them to uh, to consider it. And then I also did a piece, another labor piece, based on those documents for the Washington Monthly, all all in that year while I was bartending. Then I went, then I moved back to Salvador as a, uh, and as a stringer, and I had uh, written to places like The Economist and tried to get them interested, and they gave me a letter of support 
which was enough to help me get a press pass. And then eventually uh, picked up uh, CBS radio because that was a, a string that was available. And I, I apparently had the voice for it. I didn't know that. And, uh, and then, and then the village voice, and then started picking up other strings, the Miami Herald, to some degree, the Fort Worth Star Telegram, the Atlanta Journal Constitution, uh, the Sacramento Bee, and some other papers. So I managed to, you know, to cobble together enough strings to be able to uh, make a living. And partly because El Salvador was so cheap, I could live on twelve thousand dollars a year. You know, uh, okay. There. So stringer is. I, I've never heard that for you're just stringing different jobs along different writing gigs. Yeah. It's mean, it means a freelancer, doing. right? You know, okay, you're, okay. you're, you're writing for somebody. Maybe if you're a super stringer, you might have press credentials and you're writing for regularly for them or reporting regularly, which is what I had yeah. with CBS news. Uh, but, um, and the village voice. Yeah. And then you others, know, you might be once a month, once every six months, you know? Okay. I mean, this is pretty intense stuff. Was, was there anyone who's kind of like, your role model for this type of writing, this kind of lifestyle? Cause I mean, I would imagine it's pretty all consuming in the sense. I mean, you're, you're sort of embedded in these places you're writing. I'm guessing you're, you're probably like in Salvador. I mean, you're like going into the jungle and back down things like that. I mean, is it like that? I mean, you were pretty much in the, in the combat zones. Well, I started off trying to, you know, focusing on the labor movement, which I thought made right. sense. And I decided I'm going to wait before I start doing any any uh, combat reporting or guerrilla reporting, right? Which was a smart okay. move, I think. But then as once I moved there, I started to meet photographers in particular who were making guerrilla trips on a fairly regular basis. So I started going out with them and developing and then developing my own guerrilla contacts. And eventually I became, you know, uh, one of the people on the ground who had some of the best contacts with the guerrillas and did guerrilla stories in different parts of the country, including one uh, in 1988 on the eve of elections uh, on, with the guerrillas on the San Salvador volcano overlooking the capital city, which was well received. And I was the envy of the press corps uh, at the time. It came out right before the elections. And uh, and it also got me on the, the radar of, to some degree, I know, I know I had an interview on background once with somebody at the CIA, you know, arranged by them. And somebody, you know, I knew that they they were reading those stories, but I also got on the radar radar of Salvadoran military intelligence. But now, by now, I was also speaking to visiting congressional aides, and so I had enough connections that I felt reasonably safe. Uh, okay. Though, you know, it was it was uh, it was you know, and this was six months before the offensive. That piece was titled "Waiting for Tet" because I knew the guerrillas were studying the Tet offensive. And, that's what they had in mind. And, um, and then, you know, by November, this was in March, by November, that proved to be, uh, they, they, put, they were able to put that into, into practice. Um, so I was doing a lot of guerrilla trips and, you know, um, and, also doing, and also doing other kinds of stories. For instance, I did a story for the Sacramento Bee, which, um, which was quite, had made a, something of an impact based on the fact that in the Salvadoran daily newspapers, you were ads You'd see ads in Spanish saying, cross the border without walk, walking, call our agency, we'll help get you into the United States. You know, open, <laughs> smugglers, you know, not, not, not being underground, but advertising in the paper. And I, you know, and I went and, and, uh, to a few of these places and interviewed some people and ended up doing a story, which upset the Border Patrol because uh, this, the Salvadorans are claiming, well, we pay people to, get, to help them get across, right? Somebody told me off the record from one of those places and uh, we're not off the record, but you know, without using the person's name and, um, and the border patrol said, you know, we don't, we don't tolerate corruption. And I said, look, you know, something's going on because every day there's at least 10 of these ads in the newspaper. So somebody's running these ads, somebody's taking the service and somebody's happy enough with the service to tell their friends that they keep coming back. Right. So, you know, things like that, you know, a place like Salvador is full of stories, right? Uh, yeah. Besides just the war. So it's kind of like, we don't tolerate corruption, but make us an offer, like that kind of thing? Well, I think that by and large, most Border Patrol officers are, are, are have integrity or not taking bribes, but enough of them yeah. are that uh, that becomes a problem, like with any institution. Right. And what did you kind of think of, of being in Salvador generally? I mean, I've never been to Central America, but I've been to uh, 
Quito in South America, and it's a really beautiful place. Did you did you like living there despite some of the dangers? Oh, I loved it. I really enjoyed it. Um, yeah. You know, we were, you know, an hour, less than an hour from the beach, I think, from San Salvador to La Libertad, and there's a few other beaches. And I had friends, you know, I had friends in different, uh, you know, through a, a different strata of society. And one of my friends, his uncle had a beach house in one of the really nicer places uh, down from La Libertad. So we used to go there and, and have a blast, you know. I mean, it was uh, it was fun. And I, I also enjoyed, um, uh, to be honest, uh, I would... I would drive you, you would drive uh in the middle of the night to get past army checkpoints because at night they would sleep and then you could get into guerrilla zones and um and those are fascinating right the landscape is beautiful but also you know seeing the activity that's going on uh uh in these areas right and including you know uh trips that i took with guerrillas as i developed better context even including you know touring a bomb making factory or they're making uh uh, landmines, right? Homemade landmines and things like that, right? So it was a fascinating, it was a fascinating time. And as a, you know, as a young reporter, it seemed, um, you know, I thought I was right where I wanted to be, you know, and was able to do do stories I wanted to do and and um, and get published and make just enough money to to keep going, you know. Yeah, and again, as a writer, like, were you content doing freelance work, or were you trying to? I don't really even know how it works, like trying to get a full-time job at a, at a, at a big paper or what was kind of your game plan at the time? I wanted to cover the, the conflict in Salvador. I wasn't interested necessarily. There are a lot more people that had gone to Nicaragua. I didn't really, wasn't that interested in that story. Um, yeah. You know, this, the, what was happening in Salvador intrigued me longer. So I would have liked to have gotten a job, but those jobs are far, were far and few between even back then. And I was, yeah. somebody recommended me for a position at the Chicago uh, Tribune, I think. And, uh, and you know, one of the, the best clip I had was the nation story based on U.S. documents. And the fact that it was in the nation was enough for the Chicago Tribune editors to say no, you know. And then the, 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 the correspondent who had recommended me said, you know, I, I didn't, I just found out too that they had never endorsed a Democrat for president, apparently. Uh, you know, so that, yeah, that yeah. also, you know, the editor and explaining why we're not going to take somebody who's written for the nation, you know, and this was, okay. this was not today when, you know, that could be used against you. This is back in 1989. So, you know, um, yeah, I, I, you know, it would have been nice to have gotten a job, but I think I always uh, wanted the job to come to me. I wasn't, you know, I wanted to do the reporting that I wanted to do. Um, you know, you pay a price for your autonomy. But at the same time, to me, the autonomy is priceless. Yeah. You know? Well, and, and again, looking at your resume and kind of all the, the different places you've covered, it, it would seem like it would be hard to kind of have a <laughs> a conventional home life or something. You know what I mean? I mean, you've got to be over there. You're you're kind of traveling the world. And again, like I said, it just seems like it's an all consuming job. I mean, you're just like you're committed to these these stories and. I don't know how like how how often were you getting back home when you're covering things? Um, were you pretty much just in Salvador the whole time, or would you be able to come back? On my, you know, I would come back at least once a year, right? Um, yeah. Sometimes twice a year. By '89, um, there was a group that uh, had arranged for reporters to speak to a visiting congressional delegate, human rights congressional delegation. And that same group ended up organizing a tour for myself and three other journalists to go to Washington, New York, and Boston. So that got me back, you know, on somebody else's dime, which was, uh, which was great, right? It didn't happen yeah. all the time, but it happened. But, you know, the flights between Salvador and New York were, New York, Newark were not, you know, weren't that prohibitive. So I came mm-hmm. back at least once, once a year, if not twice a year. Did it kind of feel weird when you were back? After I had been exposed to some combat, it started to feel weird because it would be feel strange that, you know, I'm, I'm driving down Connecticut Avenue in Washington, D.C., and all of a sudden wondering why nobody's, why nobody's blowing up power lines, which happened all the time <laughs> in El Salvador by the guerrillas. Or why isn't anybody mortaring this position? Right. And then, you're, and then yeah. you're like, what are you talking about? You're in Connecticut Avenue, in, you know, in northwest Washington. Right. So you started yeah. to realize that there was, you know, lingering effects of, of the conflict, which, you know, combined with other experiences, you know, 
uh, did a number on me and it took me a while to recover. Right. Um, which we can talk about that too, if you wish, you know, it is when you have that experience, you have to decompress. Right. No, I I mean, in, in some ways you're, you're in a much more stressful situation than a lot of the military people are. I mean, cause you know, there's a lot of support troops and people at the base and stuff like that doing things. But, you know, if you're, <laughs> going in kind of behind the lines, essentially. I mean, that's, that sounds pretty dangerous. Um, and I know you were in Iraq. I want to talk about that, but what was sort of your, I mean, as a political guy and activist, like, I know you, you have to be, you have to maintain a certain amount of objectivity with your writing, but what was sort of your take on U S policy generally in that part of the world at the time? Was it just completely screwed up or was it just, we needed a regime change with the presidents? Like how was your take politically on what's happening? Uh, Ray Bonner, who's somebody, one of the people I looked up to wrote in weakness in the seat, right? It was all weakness in the seat because they were willing to do anything they could to prevent a country from falling to communism under their watch. That was their primary objective. And any, any and everything else that they did or thought was, was, arranged around that objective. And the problem is, well, what would happen if the guerrillas did take power? Would that be the end of the world? Because the regime that you are supporting is a brutal death squad driven regime. Their approach to military combat is not to kill the guerrillas in combat, but to kill any of the civilians whom they suspect of supporting the guerrillas, which has really been the pattern throughout Latin America. So I've seen a lot of that in Colombia too, in more recent decades. And so you have an abusive regime. They thought that with this guy Duarte, they could clean it up. And what happened by the time the offensive came in 1989 and the, and the military killed the, the Jesuits, they did that because the military was so frustrated having had their hands tied by U.S. policy and conditions on U.S. aid and, uh, and, the, uh, the, and the oversight that Congress and Democrats in Congress like Joe Mowgli put on that aid that the military was so upset that they said, you know what, now we're going to do it our way or really the Guatemalan way. Because the Guatemalans, uh, they were so abusive, they couldn't get congressional aid. So all their aid came, came through the CIA. It didn't have to be approved uh, uh, by Congress. And so the, Gua- the Salvadorans decided to kill the Jesuits, who were the largest, the most vocal, their most vocal and poignant critics of the military. And they were, the Jesuits were also the biggest advocates for a negotiated settlement to the war which the army didn't want because the army was also making a lot of money off the war besides, uh, besides waging it against the guerrillas. And uh, Joel Millman did a story for the New York Sunday magazine about that uh, around that time, about how the military had gold soldiers and people on the payroll. So, so all the senior officer corps besides leading troops were also seems like lining their pockets. Right. And it seemed to me um, U S policy was designed to cover this up. And just to give you one example, there was a massacre in a village called San Sebastian, San Sebastian in, in El Salvador in 1988. And the new U.S. ambassador had just gotten there, William Walker. And I had been there since the previous ambassador. And Ambassador Walker said he would stake his, his, his career and, repu- and, and reputation on getting, uh, bringing justice for the massacre at San Sebastian. And uh, over, uh, I think three years later, um, none of this, or, two, or almost two years later, none of this had happened. There was no justice for this massacre. And I asked him on the record in front of other reporters, well, are you, are you planning on resigning from the State Department since you pledged that you would stake your career? And he, he, got, he didn't like the question. And, uh, and, and, and really, he didn't like the question. And he gave a dodge of an answer. He didn't like the question because, well, you know, I said that, basically. I said that when I said it. But that was just for political reasons to show we were trying to be strong on human rights. I never really meant it that I would actually stake my career on it, which to me, then you never should have said it. You know, it was yeah. that kind of thing that I found, you know, just appalling, just, you know, beneath the dignity of, I think, what the, what the nation should stand for. And so that's what I saw happening in El Salvador. They, when, they, when the army killed the Jesuits, and Walker also tried to blame it on the guerrillas and blamed it on the guerrillas for more than two months uh, uh, until finally uh, a U.S. military advisor came forward and said, well, I was told that the Army did it and uh, by somebody who didn't want to get blamed for it in the Army. 
And then Walker had to reevaluate his tone. But for more than two months, he blamed guerrillas for something that everybody knew the army did and only the army could have done. And I know the Jesuits, the surviving Jesuits in the Catholic community in El Salvador never forgave him. And, uh, and for me, I, you know, I, he was, a, he was somebody I interacted with and, uh, and dealt with, but I, you know, I thought that was really, uh, quite frankly, shameless and unfortunate. And it didn't accomplish anything that the attempted cover-ups accomplished nothing. It didn't advance U.S. policy. It, it just put a stain on, on the, on U.S. activities in the, and the, and the, and the United States in El Salvador at the time and impeded the wheels of justice and impeded the ability to end the war. And at the end, they switched to, they switched tunes and they said, oh yeah, now we want to negotiate a settlement. Yeah, the army did it. We've got to, we've got to punish the army. We've got to bring them to the table. And, you know, and I've been writing just about that at the time. And I thought, well, you know, glad you could finally make the party. What took you so long? Yeah, it can be pretty exhausting when you're just seeing government officials lie to you <laughs> repeatedly. Uh, I mean, we, you know, just went through that, a lot of that. And, it, it, you know, it'll, it'll always keep happening to some extent. But, yeah, it's pretty it's pretty brazen uh, with the with with these uh, politicians sometimes. Did you think that there was an improvement under Clinton or do you feel like it was more of the same? Well, the Clinton administration, um, there was something of an improvement. But by by the 90s, I was focused on Guatemala because that war was still occurring. And um, and I was interested. I covered human rights abuses in Guatemala. But um, there was one one uh, one massacre that occurred. They pulled some people off a bus. And, by the, and looked at their clothing and knew what town they were from and killed them. And uh, I remember speaking to an editor and saying, and he said, look, another massacre else in Guatemala, Frank, is that really news? And I said, you know, I, 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 I thought, you know, come wow. on. And then I said, yeah. okay, how about this? Maybe it is. But if I get the same, uh, if I get senior army officers for running tons of cocaine to the United States, would you run that story? Would that be news? And he said, yeah, I think that would be news. So I, I shifted gears and started focusing on the high command's involvement in, in uh, multi-ton level cocaine transshipments and eventually was able to establish that the, the intelligence chiefs who were the architects of Guatemala's acts of genocide were themselves named in the document signed by uh, Ambassador Stephen McFarland, now retired, uh, that named them as uh, the leaders of one of the five major cartels operating in the 90s uh, in Guatemala. All right. And that document was uh, one of the ones released by WikiLeaks and Julian Assange. Um, so uh, the Clinton administration at the time, uh, and I did a piece for the Village Voice, they were trying to blame Haiti for cocaine trafficking uh, for political, partly for, it was true, but it was also for political reasons in terms of their own intervention in Haiti. And they were completely ignoring Guatemala, which was running five times more or so uh, cocaine to the United States. I mean, Haiti's a poor country. How much cocaine could it be moving? Where Guatemala is on, you know, just south of Mexico, and it's a robust, relatively robust economy. And Guatemala was moving a great many, a great, a great deal of cocaine to the United States. And the Clinton administration covered up the motive behind the murder of the Guatemalan Chief Justice to stop the extradition of an army officer. And I did that for the Wall Street Journal, and then uh, later on for the Texas Observer in a more in a more uh, comprehensive piece. So the Clinton administration was so busy trying to push for a negotiated settlement to end the war in El Salvador so they could take credit to say, we helped end the war, I'm sorry, in Guatemala. We helped end the war in Guatemala. They were willing to look the other way about the military uh, involvement in drug trafficking and even look the other way when uh, the Guatemalan chief justice was murdered over a case brought, brought in Tampa for DEA evidence to stop the extradition uh, of, of, uh, of the first Guatemalan army officer wanted for drug trafficking in the United States. And I thought that was a continuation of the same kind of policy that you have some objective you want to reach, which will make you look good in the polls, right? We, we brought peace to Guatemala and you're covering up the murder of the chief justice who was standing up for the rule of law, not only in his country, but in your country. And I eventually got the DEA to admit this on the record, but it took me 10 years to finally uh, get enough evidence to really corner them, right? Uh, and, you know, told, told the inspector general, I know you've received my facts and my queries, sir. So please know that if, you know, if you're going to answer my questions about this uh, Guatemalan chief justice murder 10 years ago, if you, if you choose not to answer, that's fine. But please know that your name and your title will be in the story on the record. 
And within within an hour, public affairs called me back and said, we'd like to give you the interview that you had been denying me now for years. Right. You know, these were um, if I were if I were working for somebody in covering stories that, the, you know, that they wanted me to cover, there's no way I could have had I could have stayed with these stories, which, you know, I thought was important to do. Right. Right. You know? Do you still write about that part of the world? Not lately. I mean, Guatemala is also yeah. the, the nature of the cocaine tra- trade has switched so much that um, I think I did the stories that I wanted to do. And, you know, um, uh, my expertise is now is now quite dated. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, the, 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 the drug market uh, does operate like a water balloon. Right. You squeeze one, it comes out somewhere else. But what I wanted to show was the impunity that the, that the Guatemalan high command had for committing massive human rights abuses, including uh, acts of genocide, wiping out men, women and children in 444 villages or 440 villages, among other acts, um, had a direct link then to tie over into uh, impunity for, for running multi tons of cocaine and uh, uh, transshipments uh, to the United States. And I thought that needed to be that needed to be uh, understood. And it was a tough story because the human rights community didn't like to focus on anything but human rights. Right. And though, so they, you know, they were not terribly, they were somewhat sympathetic, but not that sympathetic. And then others were like, well, you know, why are you writing about the war on drugs? You know, where the war on drugs is bad. And, you know, and it's like, <laughs> whatever my, whatever I believe should be the policy in the war on drugs, the fact that you have former intelligence chiefs being uh, heads of cocaine cartels, transshipment cartels, and they're operating with impunity is a story no matter how you cut it. Right. And so, um, you know, I, it, it was it was a tricky one to get out there, but eventually I finally did. Well, and you you're talking about the um, the offensive, and you said 1989 in mm-hmm. Salvador, mm-hmm. and in to my memory of politics uh, growing up, I mean, yeah, by '89 you see the fall of the Berlin Wall, they capture Noriega, but then by 1990, it's convenient. It's 1990. It's like the 90s. We start focusing more in the Middle East with the Gulf War. And obviously you were, you were there for that kind of, when did you, I mean, how did you sort of wrap things up, quote unquote, in Central America and then head over to the Middle East with the invasion of, of, of Kuwait and everything? Did you see, well, this is going to be a huge story. I want to get over there. I went home for the holidays um, in 1990 and it was clear to me that um, at this point, there was so much attention faced on the buildup uh, for the Gulf War that uh, military institutions could kill every Jesuit throughout Latin America, and that would barely make a blip uh, with this uh, coming uh, conflict uh, over Kuwait. And so I convinced I convinced the Village Voice to give me, uh, I think, eight hundred dollars or something toward a plane ticket uh, to fly over, which uh, to fly into Amman, Jordan, and uh, the plane. You had to pay cash in addition to your flight at the gate of the plane in case the plane was shot down. It would They knew it wouldn't. The insurance may not cover it, right? So it was a very strange time, right, yeah. uh, to get into Amman. And, um, and then once I got there, CBS News had hotel rooms that they had booked in advance to make sure they had them, that they actually weren't using all of, all of those rooms. So they gave me uh, a hotel room in the Intercontinental Hotel, which saved me a lot of money. And, um, and then I started doing stories for the Christian Science Monitor, who I um, had had a relationship with but hadn't written for much before because uh, there was another string in Salvador, Chris Norton, uh, who has since passed, but a great journalist who was, was covering that. So I started stringing for the, uh, for the uh, Monitor and a few others, but I was frustrated at being kept out of, uh, kept in Amman, couldn't get into Iraq. The Iraqis um, weren't letting, uh, they're going to let Stringer in, right? They let. CNN and, and, and some other journalists, but not many. And then uh, we covered refugees, myself and some other journalists that were coming over the border. And that was a, that was a good story. And there was, it was a complicated story. And then there was a diplomatic story because King Hussein and, and the Jordanian government had been sympathetic to Saddam, but uh, the feeling was that once the war was in it, that the relationship with, between Jordan and the United States, which had been a warm one, would resume. And I did a diplomatic story on that for the Christian Science Monitor that I thought was good. Um, and I had some good contacts in the Jordanian uh, government military as well, which proved to be uh, very helpful. And then myself and uh, Gad Gross, who I met in Amman, ended up traveling uh, 
we thought we would, the uprisings now had begun uh, in the South, right? First in the, uh, in the, with the Shia, a Shia rebellion that had occurred. And this is after George H.W. Bush encouraged Iraqis to rise up and toss Saddam aside, toss him aside, right? Trying to provoke a coup from within his own officer corps, from within the Sunni Arab minority, uh, the ruling clique and the ruling group, the ethnic and religious group around Saddam that had that had dominated Iraq now since uh, 1979 and his his takeover uh, back then, and um, we thought we could uh, go go to Turkey and go into Iraq with the Kurds, right, with Kurdish guerrillas that we knew were still active, but had not yet uh, launched their own uprising, and we ended up covering Iraq, an Iraqi opposition conference hosted by the Saudis in uh, West Beirut, uh, in Lebanon, whose war by then was over. So it was possible to go into Lebanon reasonably safely. And we went in with a Syrian military escort from Damascus, covered this Iraqi opposition conference. And the feeling was that everyone thought Saddam was going down. So everyone is jockeying for power. And you've got a, a gentleman there who's sort of close to the State Department who was ready to set up a government in exile. You've got Shia groups and Shia clerics who had come from Iran who became uh, who became some of uh, some of uh, some of my sources and people that I uh, was able to quote uh, on the record, uh, even as well as uh, Kurdish groups, and then uh, we went back to to, uh, to Damascus, and then we ended up getting uh, the Kurds to help us and the Syrian government to give us uh, to facilitate our ability to travel to uh, then eastern Syria, commissionally, and then cross the Tigris River and then go into Iraq with the Kurds which we did. And we spent time in Tahuk, in Zako, in Tahuk, and then eventually Erbil, uh, where we interviewed Barzani, right? And nobody, at this point, the Kurds, two weeks after the Shias went into rebellion in the south, the Kurds launched their rebellion in the north. And within a week, they had liberated most of uh, Kurdistan, Iraq, most of Kurdish-speaking Iraq, including Kirkuk, this is the oil-rich city uh, further south. Uh, the only city in the north that was still under Saddam's control was Mosul, and we saw fighters marching to to Mosul. And now I'm, I was also filming for CBS Television at this point because they had a, a high eight millimeter camera that they asked me to bring in for them uh, to shoot on a right of first refusal basis, meaning no guarantee, no no special pay, but you know we'd like the first dibs of looking at anything you film since you're using our camera to see if we want to use it. And, uh, and uh, there was no, no resistance whatsoever. We went all the way south to Kirkuk, uh, where the Kurds uh, were maintaining a position. We had um, seen, we had gone to military bases and read through or had someone read through in translation right while we were filming and, uh, and writing as well. Um, one Ra- Iraqi soldier defecting after another. Um, uh, as, as, the, as Iraqi soldiers just affected en masse from their bases. And Iraqi uh, officers were executing some of those soldiers uh, who they caught uh, trying to defect. So we had the impression the Iraqi army had collapsed and that Saddam was by and large uh, defeated and that it was only a matter of time before, um, uh, before Saddam would be, would be toppled. And I later obtained a CIA report through the Freedom of Information Act that also predicted Saddam was going down, that Saddam would, was not likely to survive, right? And this is around mid mid to late March, around uh, March, around the same time we managed going in around the, around the first or second day of spring, around March 21st, 22nd, um, and the CIA report was dated around the same time. We then were in Kirkuk um, when a, a counteroffensive began, and uh, this was with tanks and helicopter gunships. And the guerrillas uh, thought they could hold it. And we were embedded with uh, an Iraqi Communist Party commander who was also the intelligence chief for the, for the Peshmerga, for the guerrilla coalition in Kirkuk, which uh, to me made sense that he would be the best guy to be in touch, you know, to be, to be close to because he would, he would know, he would have the intelligence that would be in the, give us indications of what was, of whether or not they were going to be able to hold it or not. And he ended up being wrong. They ended up getting clobbered. We ended up getting uh, pinned down and then and then uh, spent the night hiding out uh, from Iraqi soldiers who really had camped all around us. In the morning, they found uh, Gad as well as a Kurdish guerrilla whom we, who had volunteered to be our guide and we had befriended. Uh, he was at a Kalashnikov and a, and a pistol. 
they executed one after the other. We heard that, didn't see it, but saw Gad's camera bags being carried away, so we knew it was him. They, they found us an hour later and were going to shoot us, but then they had an argument and eventually went through a series of interrogations and then to a safe house in Baghdad and then prison, uh, what I think now is uh, Abu Ghraib. And uh, after 18 days of being held incommunicado, so we weren't hostages, we were held in secret, uh, on the last night of Ramadan, which is sort of like uh, Christmas Eve in the in the Christian world, um, uh, you know, the, the, the 40 day period of, um, of fasting uh, and the Muslim festival fit to eat. Uh, we were, we were let go right before midnight by, uh, under Saddam's orders. So that's the, that story in a nutshell. That, that's a pretty amazing story. What, in terms of like the American presence at that point, I mean, I know you, there was an understanding that, you know, if, like you said, if, if there's a Kurdish uprising, if, if Iraqis rise up against Saddam, you know, they'll have a good chance to overthrow him. The war, the ground war is over at this point, but uh, there's this Kurdish rebellion. Were, were you seeing any American troops or do, what was your sense of the American presence at that point? Like how far are they? Like, Well, know, there's, there was no American presence in the North whatsoever. And there had never okay, been. Okay. The Americans had invaded from Kuwait and Saudi Arabia. Right. And they had traveled as far North as, uh, you know, South of Baghdad. So they had crushed the Iraqi army that had deployed in the South, but there was no presence whatsoever in the North. It okay. was purely Iraqi. So it was a, a civil war, right? A, a insurgent counterinsurgent conflict. And Schwarzkopf had allowed Saddam in negotiations to end the Gulf War to be able to fly helicopters to transport wounded, allegedly, and, and supplies. But then when he started using the uh, Soviet MiG helicopter gunships, which have both uh, uh, 50 caliber miniguns, as they're called, as well as rocket pods, right, which is these are bigger gunships than we ever saw in Salvador. Uh, Schwarzkopf didn't do anything when first Saddam crushed the Shias in the south with these gunships and then, uh, and then started using them against the Kurds. And then when the, when the Kurdish refugees fled over the border into Turkey and there was international outrage, then and only then did the Bush administration impose a no-fly zone. But it was too little too late to stop the, you know, the, 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 the slaughter of, of the, the Kurdish uprising, which... Uh, where they killed uh, armed guerrillas and civilians alike, right? They made, they, you know, I saw that. They made no attempt to discriminate between women and children and armed uh, fighters. It's, it's a pretty horrible story. I, I mean, again, to kind of oversimplify our, our stance on this, but I mean, did we just kind of turn our backs on the Kurds? Or is it more complicated than that? The H.W. Bush administration turned their backs on both the Shias and the Kurds, though they were never particularly enamored with the Shias. But uh, what they were hoping for throughout is that, well, sooner or later, somebody's going to overthrow Saddam, right? Somebody from within the army would overthrow Saddam, from within the power structure. And so they were waiting. They thought, okay, well, it didn't happen with the Shias, or maybe it'll happen with the Kurds. And the Americans were desperate not to intervene because the coalition they built to prevail in the Gulf War was the, one of the biggest coalitions in the history of, uh, of uh, military coalitions led by the United States. Actually, it was the largest. And even Syria was part of that coalition, sending uh, some tank technicians, I believe. So um, they didn't want to lose that by then going in to overthrow Saddam themselves. So they, so HW would call for, you know, toss him aside, go ahead, depose him, encouraging a coup. And they watched the Shias and the Kurds because they really didn't want the Shias and the Kurds to take power. Because the Shias, they were afraid, would be too close to Iran. Of course, the irony being is that when W went in and overthrew and deposed Saddam. The Shias ended up being in power, and I ended up doing an op-ed in the New York Times, which seemed revelatory at the time, although it was just obvious, is that nearly two-thirds of Iraqis are Shias. So if you're going to go in and remove Saddam, they're going to end up in power, no matter whether you like it or not, unless you plan on imposing some dictatorship, which would not, which would not be tenable. So um, the Americans were afraid. They didn't like the Shias because they were too close to Iran in 91. They also... Didn't, they weren't sure what to do about the Kurds because they knew the Kurds were isolated to the north for the most part. So the Kurds were never going to be able to govern all of Iraq, right? That wouldn't be possible. The other, the Shias and the Sunnis both wouldn't, wouldn't tolerate that. So that's why um, they were still hoping for a coup. And in the end, they just let the Shias and the Kurds get slaughtered because uh, they had their policy had been failed, right? They hadn't thought through, uh, well, what happens if there's no coup? 
And, uh, and I think that was unfortunate. And I think it was, um, you know, should not have, it, it, there, they, they, they had other options that they chose not to pursue, namely knocking out those helicopters when they were in, when they were in flight and preventing Saddam from having that advantage. Saddam also saved from the American slaughter in the South, right? That, uh, when, uh, uh, Secretary of State Colin Powell said, we're going to cut it in half, then we're going to kill it, meaning the Iraqi army. He had saved uh, most of his uh, Iraqi Republican guards and special forces from that slaughter. They were saved to be able to prevent a coup. In addition, if you study Saddam, who had modeled himself after Stalin in particular, he had set up controls to make sure there was no possibility of dissent with his own ranks. And disgusting things, like an officer who had criticized him, cutting out his tongue, and then watching him, watching him watch his his children and wife be raped and mutilated and tortured in front of him before killing him. This kind of thing. So the notion of expecting someone after a legacy of Saddam's rule of butchery, right, including eliminating any possible forms of dissent, right, um, the notion that you were now going to provoke a coup was really naive, and it showed that the Americans didn't understand Saddam's regime, even though he had been an ally. And the CIA in particular, I don't think, had a good sense of, um, of how Saddam really operated. Because if you knew that, you would have known that the possibility of a coup from, in, from within, uh, it might have been possible uh, 10 years before during the Iran-Iraq war. Uh, right, or even even less, right, five years before during the Iran-Iraq war. But at this point, uh, it wasn't going to happen. Yeah, and it, it, the the Bush administration, their their objectives seemed so limited because they didn't want to get in some kind of quagmire, like in Viet, you know, the, the the conventional wisdom is you know we overcome the Vietnam syndrome, syndrome yeah, and we're able to defeat this army quickly conventionally, but. Bush didn't want to go on to Baghdad or anything like that. He just wanted to stop, get him out of Kuwait, and then hope that things sort of collapse with, from within. But obviously, as you say, and as events turned out, Saddam had too tight a grip on his country for, for that to happen without aid. I mean, obviously, if we had maybe gone in, we could have toppled him like we did later, but that did not happen in 91. Yeah, and even when we went in in 91, and I had written about this, you know, we were uh, they really liked uh, Ahmad Chalabi, right, who, uh, uh, an Iraqi exile who really had no no constituency in Iraq, and was really not um, uh, not a not a leader that was widely respected, even among Iraqi opposition groups. But he spoke English well, and he told Americans what they wanted to hear. And uh, I wrote about the fact that you know if you want to overthrow Saddam, there are a lot of you know you have to stand in line because nobody has more enemies in the Middle East or in his own country than he does. But there's no way of of getting rid of him without having to deal with the Shia majority in particular, right? And you've got to, you've got to address that. And I didn't think that the Shia majority was going to necessarily end up as being a proxy of Iran. I thought that was a misreading of of the relations between Iraqi Shias and Iranian Shias, which I think proved to be somewhat to the case because the Iranians have gained influence in Iraq, but not to the point that uh, you could, I think, call Shia-led Iraqi governments that have had power since as being proxies. They operate with their own autonomy. And the United States eventually figured this out, but it would have, you know, um, uh, it would have been much better if they had figured that out earlier, right? I yeah. think the problem with uh, going in uh, in 2003 was the fact that you put U.S. troops on the ground, which was never necessary and really created uh, tremendous problems for the United States and for Iraqis. And um, I, I advocated backing... Uh, uh, at the Iraq, Iraqi opposition groups toward taking power with the help of the United States, but without U.S. troops on the ground. And, um, you know, I was criticized for that, and I understand those criticisms, but uh, considering how things turned out with the, with the Shias in power anyway, that would have been a much, uh, a much preferable route than what they did, right? With tremendous loss of American life and treasure, and as well as tremendous Iraqi life and a brutal long civil war and with Americans in the middle of it, that didn't have to go the way it went. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, and I think by the time George W. Bush is in office, I mean, the understanding of the Arab world with Bush and I think other people was not very good. <laughs> I mean, knowing the difference between Shia and Sunni and the differences of, you know, Shia and Iran, Shia and Iraq, I just don't think there was really, they just didn't think it through in terms of how these groups are going to act once we 
look, go in like, there a bull in a china shop, you know? Look, like I can, I can add some insight here, right? I, uh, you know, I, I, I had some conversations with Wolfowitz at the time, right before when the Clinton administration was still in power. And uh, he recommended me to debate uh, two people that were uh, critical of the rollback policy, right? Ken Pollock and, uh, and uh, 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 Gideon, I think, David Gideon, I think is his name, uh, uh, from Foreign Affairs. And in these debates, what I learned is that when the uh, foreign policy uh, groups got together to discuss Iraq, they like to talk about the core and the periphery, right? The core, meaning the Sunni Arab core that had always taken power. The periphery were both the Shia, the Shia Arab majority concentrated in, uh, in Baghdad and, and throughout the south and the Kurdish minority concentrated in the north. But by using the terms core and periphery, they somehow glossed over and ended up forgetting that, in fact, the Shias were nearly two thirds of Iraqis. And they got this so wrong. Right. And if you look at the Almanac, it was also confusing that even Henry Kissinger wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post, which was never corrected, actually. And I had a letter that they, that they were going to run and then it got killed because she, Kissinger said, well, the key thing is after Iraq is defeating, uh, once you get rid of the Sunni Arabs to keep the, 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 the Kurdish and Shia minorities both in check. Right. The problem is the, the Shias weren't a minority. They're always treated like a minority because they were always second class citizens. But they were, in fact, uh, the, the overwhelming majority, not 51 percent, but somewhere between 60 and 62, 63 percent uh, of, of Iraqis. And um, that was extraordinary. And foreign affairs in a piece that the people I was debating also got that wrong in their piece. Right. And they eventually had uh, they eventually corrected that. But the, the, you know, the corrections never caught on. And then William Sapphire, the New York Times columnist, did a piece saying the same thing. So nobody knew, and Bush eventually uh, admitted he didn't know the Shias were, were the majority in Iraq either. He even said that. So I ended up calling the Times and getting an op-ed in Iraq's Forgotten Majority, which didn't say anything that everybody quickly figured out was the case. But hey, most Iraqis are Shias. They didn't know that. And the, and the, and the, the anti-war crowd also didn't know that because they didn't want to say anything that would show that Saddam was as widely hated as he was. And if you start talking about the fact that most Iraqis are, sh are Shias, that leads you to conclude, well, most Shias hate, hate Saddam, that he was widely unpopular. The anti-war crowd didn't want to touch that either. So, you know, we both, uh, you know, we, the United States, both the pro-war and the anti-war crowd, right, and its various factions, we're all taking what I, Edward Said called an Orientalist view of Iraq, because we were looking at Iraq through the lens of them being objects of our foreign policy goals, whether you're for or against or, or had some nuance there, somewhere in between, which is where I would put myself, though, uh, that was not appreciated by either side, it seemed. Right? But they, um, they, they weren't looking at the Iraqis as, as subjects to realize that most Iraqis are, are Shias. And yes, they hate Saddam, but they don't necessarily want to live under your rule either, you know? And uh, the lack of, of even caring, you know, most of the stories about Iraq at the time were about what we thought about Iraq, what the Americans were going to do and what Congress is saying and, and the policy disputes. There was little reporting on the ground and little real analysis of what, of, uh, what Iraq was all about. And I think we paid a terrible price for our own ignorance. And um, I'm not sure we've learned, uh, learned much from that experience. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, the, the intelligence failures leading up to 2003 and the invasion is just, it's kind of astounding, um, especially since, you know, a lot of the same guys who were there in 91, um, who were, who were in charge. But, um, after, after you're released, like what, what's your next move after that? Did you go home right away or did you go back to Central America? What was your next assignment after, after? Yeah, out of prison. I well, I actually ended up going on a on a delegation, a human rights delegation to Guatemala, and some you know, people who you know who had brought me up on, on other on another few other delegations thought, well, this would be good for you to sort of get back on the saddle. And I had always um, Guatemala was always of great interest to me. Um, it's where I sort of went first, went to Central America, where uh, after the Sal the war in El Salvador was over, finally it took a while, a little bit longer. You know, I really thought there was unfinished business. There were still stories that needed to be done on Guatemala. And it was still, you know, peace was not around, just around the corner like it was in uh, in Salvador. So I ended up moving to Guatemala for a while. And the idea was to finish a book on El Salvador, which I never ended up finishing. And I was really in a recovery period, 
right? Um, which I think was very good for me, and I think it was a good it was a good place to be. But as I'm <laughs> recovering, right, and um, you know, living in a beautiful lake in Guatemala, and and uh, and you know, living cheaply, but you know, enjoying enjoying myself and sort of you know, trying to take stock of the experience that had and the trauma that had just occurred, I couldn't help but being. Uh, being dragged into different different human rights stories in Guatemala, and then ultimately human rights stories that um, were motivated by drug trafficking. And I was able to uncover that in uh, eastern Guatemala, there was a case that ended up being a very big case uh, where the mayor of the town was eventually extradited to New York and convicted of drug trafficking. But he was working hand in hand with the army, that part the DEA never got to. And they were, they were, they were systematically... Uh, forcing peasants off land, right, including killing a bunch of them. And the peasants then signed a petition and sent it to the U.S. Embassy. And I got a copy of this petition. Most of them signed it with their thumbprints because they were illiterate, right? And they laid out claims that uh, these peasants were tortured in the army base and then they were executed. And then these campesinos, right, uh, were tortured and then they were executed. And then the army came and, and then, then now you've got hundreds of 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 squatting families who had lived on this on this land and not been touched for over a generation now being forced off in order to build clandestine runways to smuggle cocaine, right? And it seemed like, well, how you know is this true? Well, yeah, it's true because the mayor they implicated, uh, he was later he was later arrested and and extradited and charged in New York uh, for drug trafficking. So I started, you know, I I sort of was on recreation, right and and trying to recover, but then ended up um, covering these other stories. Um, and then I eventually went back to, uh, went back to the States. And then uh, somebody from Human Rights Watch who had followed my work in Salvador and Iraq and Guatemala, um, and I had seen him in Guatemala actually uh, during that period, ended up bring, bringing me on board for what was the arms division, a new division of Human Rights Watch, which was going to examine arms transfers as well as monitor things like use of landmines. Right, weapons that uh, that you know they thought should be prohibited, and um, they that Human Rights Watch sent me to Rwanda, and then after that to Colombia, and then after that to Sudan, and so for the rest of the nineties, um, I was reporting for Human Rights Watch, but also had the autonomy to do my own stories, um, as long as for ethical reasons I disclosed that the research had been paid for by Human Rights Watch, um, and okay. then did. Um, you know, the, uh, the arming, France's role in arming Rwanda before the genocide, which I think is still the biggest story I've ever, I've ever had. Uh, in Colombia, the militaries, we did a report, the U.S. military, uh, paramilitary relationship about how the military in Colombia had reorganized its intelligence war, uh, networks based on the recommendations of, the, of, of U.S. military and CIA advisors. We were able to nail all that down. And then set up new intelligence networks through a covert chain of command so it couldn't be traced back. That became death squads, killing trade union leaders, journalists, and others, um, which was a good story. At the same time, I obtained documents uh, showing the diversion of, I think, 11 out of 13 U.S. Colombian military units that Amnesty International had cited for abuses, specific abuses, human rights abuses in their recent report. The U.S. military and Southcom did their own internal audit of that report and showed that 11 out of 13 of those units had received U.S. training or aid. And I ended up passing those documents. And there was some, you know, in Human Rights Watch, um, there was a feeling um, for a variety of reasons that I can't get into, but that the documents were not, um, they, they, didn't, they didn't want to run those documents. So I ended up giving them Amnesty International with, with Human Rights Watch's permission and that became the basis of the Leahy Law, right? It generated a New York Times lead editorial uh, even before the Human Rights Watch report came out, which created some, some problems for me in Human Rights Watch. But um, the documents themselves that I gave to Amnesty ended up being the basis for the Leahy Law. So, uh, you know, from, from, I think that turned out okay. And then, uh, and then Sudan, which exposed me um, to Eritrea and Ethiopia, uh, the Horn of Africa, which was a different region of Africa that I didn't know. Um, and I was very grateful to have had that experience. And we did a report about the arming of Sudan, but it was out of that experience that we, I ended up interviewing somebody who had been a Sudanese intelligence officer who had been assigned to cover bin Laden. And that he had been uh, interrogated and tortured by his own Sudanese commanders because they thought he had gotten too close to bin Laden. 
And this individual had joined a guerrilla movement trying to overthrow the government of Sudan. I interviewed him and then ended up uh, doing filing a piece in the New Republic at the same time, right after the East Africa bombings in 1988 in uh, Dar es Salaam and, and, uh, and Nairobi. And I, I wrote a piece saying, you know, all chances are Al Qaeda did it because I knew the region, and for a number of reasons, I knew there were no other groups that could have done it but Al Qaeda, and this is why Al Qaeda would have done it. Peter Bergen wrote a piece and filed to the New Republic at the same time, and the executive editor, who knew both of us, combined the pieces, and I knew Peter too at that point. So we came out and said uh, we think Al Qaeda and Bin Laden did it before anybody else uh, did so, and then it was only a few days later that the stories came out saying, "Yeah, the CIA thinks so too." So that was the nineties. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's a pretty amazing resume you have. And by the 90s, you know, after, you know, after the Gulf War and everything, are you spending more time in the U.S. and kind of doing more writing from afar? Or are you still hitting all these spots that you're writing about? No, no, no. At this point in the 90s, I'm, I'm, based, in, I'm based in the U.S. now, okay. right? And okay. then I'm based in Washington. But I'm traveling overseas now for Human Rights Watch for the most part. Right. As well as, uh, you know, took another trip to Guatemala on my own, right. In Salvador, right. Um, uh, more, more to see friends, but also in the, than necessarily to report. Um, okay. so, uh, but the human rights watch was providing the travel and this research and I was doing reports for them, but that also gave me the opportunity to do other reporting, right. Or stories that, you know, like the story on Bin Laden that came, you know, we were, we were attempting to find out what the Sudanese government was up to in terms of, where it was getting its arms from, but uh, you know, sources had also other info. Some you know, some information you get from sources is bad, right? They they go into a professional source mode where they want to tell you what you want to hear, and they say things which whether which they think could be true, but you know, you have to confirm that because they may not be true at all, right? And I found that out. I learned, you know, I always I was always destructful of sources that claim to know too much, um, which worked out. But the part about um, about bin laden i mean that 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 checked out and that and that proved to be true but i was based in washington traveling uh largely for human rights watch sometimes for myself because you know you'd, i couldn't afford to go to africa on my own uh, and expect to break even on that all right that was part one of my talk with frank smith i hope you enjoyed that part two will be coming up next time on american rambler we talk for another 45 or 50 minutes or so about Frank's book about the National Rifle Association. So if you liked hearing us talk, you can check that out soon. And I will let you know when that is up on Twitter and on Instagram. This has been American Rambler. I am Colin Woodward, author of Marching Masters, Slavery Race in the Confederate Army During the Civil War, available through University of Virginia Press. I've not been selling much lately, so if you've not bought the book or you know someone who might like it, Help me out and buy a copy. You can also check me out at Patreon. American Rambler has a Patreon page, so you can go over there and donate whatever you want to help out the podcast, which is all free. And I do it all myself and pay for it all myself. So every little bit counts. Anything you can give on Patreon or directly to me. Send me a check. I don't care. Send cash like, uh, you know, your, your grandparents used to do. You can get a five dollar bill in the mail i don't care check me out and support this podcast if you enjoy we're almost at number 200 podcast has been going on for over five years now and i guess not doing one a week but uh putting a lot out there in the world all those back episodes are free so check them out if you want there are almost 200 now all right well the day we set our clocks forward so this sunday really flew by another mild day here in richmond went for a long bike ride and by the time i got back it was dinner time so i don't know why they make us do this with the clocks and especially do it on the weekend and if they're gonna do it at least they could do it on monday afternoon at four o'clock so we could all get out of work an hour earlier not that a lot of us are going into work anymore but why do it on sunday and make our weekend go even quicker than it does but i have heard about a bill where they're trying to undo this and i think that would be great another great thing that joe biden and congress could do right now to make life a little easier for everyone by not going through this absurd ritual of turning the clocks forward and then back again in the fall but we'll see if that happens but i would really love it if if they would do that 
All right, I will be back with another episode soon, another talk with Frank Smith, so please stay tuned and check that out. All right, thank you for listening. Take care. Bye.